Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is the latest installment of MSP Business School. My name is Brian Doyle, and with me, as always, I've got my co-hosts, Tim McNeil and Rob Rogers. So what's shaking, guys? Uh, not much, man. How you doing? Yeah. How you doing, Brian? I love the background. It's doing fantastic. Yes. You know, we, we got to make this no, stuff official. Right? Gotta change, you know, change it up a little bit. Good. Yeah. Change it up. Uh, yeah, all you've done is move to a blur because you don't want us to see uh, how untidy the background really looks. Yeah. That hurts, Brian. <laughs> that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll get a I'll get a picture for over there one of these one of these weeks. Yeah, it'll yeah, happen. Yeah. Just Probably it's on not. the list, Timmy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We we invest almost everything back into production for our for our viewers. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> But if we want to talk a little bit about tidy backgrounds, we might talk about that of our guest today, because uh, he was actually going through the, the work of actually tidying up before coming on this call. So that was fantastic. But, you know, we'd like to welcome Sean Walsh from uh, Encore Strategic Consulting today. And uh, Sean's going to share with us a little bit about his backstory, as we like to do on the show, you know, how he was once an MSP, but even had a more interesting life before that and what he's doing today. So with that, I wanna say hi, Sean, welcome. Thanks, Brian. Good welcome, sir. You guys, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to see you. Tim and, Tim and Rob only have glowing things to say about you, so you got a lot to live up to right yeah. now. This yeah, well. yeah, yeah, I, I kind of like this well. guy. <laughs> they, bought, they bought it hook, line, and yeah, yeah. We did. That's <laughs> right. We got it, sold. Was, it, was, it was more of a stronghold. It was more of a, I'm starting a peer group, and you're joining it whether you like it or not. Right, right. Almost exactly like that, actually. Just like that. We <laughs> said, yes, sir. It's a man who knows his audience, right? And that's probably something we're going to talk about today. Exactly. You two left to your own devices. We wouldn't even be on this call right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that, is that is very true. Is but anyhow, Sean, so, uh, you know, welcome to the show. And, and, you know, I'd love to for you to maybe share with us a little bit about your background and, you know, how you ended up where you are today, right? There's a, a very loaded question, I'm sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Um yeah, it was, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, I did have an MSP for over 20 years, and uh, I kind of came into that by a non-traditional path. Um, I was actually a police detective for uh, many years and uh, had a career in law enforcement, worked undercover, ran a detective division. Um, and everybody always asks, well, how do you go from that to IT? And you know, it really wasn't um, as much of a stretch as you would think. So um, during my law enforcement career, I decided I needed to go get a college degree. And I went in and figured I would sign up for a public administration degree or something along those lines. And the second semester that I was there, I had to take a computer class and I went into it kicking and screaming and they said, look, there's nothing else that fits your schedule. Just take the computer class. It's required. You have to take it. So I went into it begrudgingly and long story short, I had a fantastic professor. It just, it all just clicked before that semester was mm -hmm. over. I had maxed out two credit cards, bought my first 286. Um, ordered a mail order modem, took the whole computer apart, put it back together again, uh, might have hacked into a bulletin board or two in the process, but um, <laughs> but I found it just really resonated with me. And I've al I had always been very mechanical. Uh, so once I kind of got under the hood on the thing, I, I got the bug. And before you knew it, I changed my major to uh, computer science and business. And in the police force, we had a part-time police officer who was actually a full-time software engineer of digital equipment. And he saw the need for a records management system in police work. So he wrote a program um, that my department and several others started using. He needed some help. So I wanted to keep these skills that I was learning in computer science current. So I started working with him. Um, a few other opportunities came up with some uh, police related software. And uh, then all of a sudden this thing called computer crime started popping up. And I had a chance to get involved in some cases early on and uh, uh, really kind of found my niche there and started teaching computer crime investigation at the New Hampshire Police Academy. Um, continued on with some of these uh, software companies and, um, but. At that point, I saw the demand, 
for the networking side, started to go into that direction. Was I was able to start the company part time while I maintained my position in the police force, um, and then it just got to a point where I had to. My wife came to me and said, "I don't care which career you pick, but pick one." <laughs> so, <laughs> That's the way of it. Um, you know, went forward with the IT company and never looked back. And uh, we, we grew the uh, MSP to uh, locations in four states. Um, and I, at the end of 2017, we had a national service company come knocking on the door um, with a very attractive offer letter. And, uh, you know, we figured it was time to go because that's that's what you build a business for so that you get to exit and, you know, that hopefully someday somebody comes knocking on the door with a big check um, and they did. So it was time to, to pack it in and move on to, to the next phase. I, I mean, Sean, you, you kind of glossed over, uh, <laughs> you know, I started an MSP. I grew it to a four location MSP and then sold it. Uh, you know, well done, sir. But I like there, there had to be some things in there that just like took you from level one to level four. Like what, what would you say was the biggest thing that you learned that was able to help you grow like that? Because that's very well done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there were a lot of lessons. Um, some more easily learned than others. <laughs> um, as I, as I often say, I only learn things the hard way, but I, I do learn. Um, you know, there were some very dramatic um, learning curves in there. Like, you know, we were, we were starting to grow and I, I think we were at uh, about four people and I had my, my right-hand man uh, who, who still works with me to this day doing consulting, but he came in and quit and I didn't see it coming. And, you know, he came to me and said, you know, I can't take it anymore. You're always mad. You're always yelling. And I'm like, I, I don't yell. You know, I don't, I don't get mad. I, I like to vigorously debate my position, but like, you know, do you remember that you were yelling about this? And I'm like, you mean six months ago? I don't even remember what I had for dinner. And, but, you know, what happened was I found that when I left the police department, I had some really bad examples of, of leadership and management style. And that really drove me to find new opportunities. But the funny thing is, is, you know, there's an old saying that sometimes we become what we hate the most. What I didn't realize is that because I had had no other experience of management like that, that I was taking all those bad habits of managing people, you know, by intimidation, by, by directing people instead of, you know, instead of working with people, um, I, uh, I brought those to the table without even realizing it. And so, and Tom came in and quit. And that was kind of a, a shock to me. But of course, being the, the stubborn pig headed person that I am, I said, well, fine, you know, you, you can leave too. And, you know, and then all of a sudden I found I was losing other employees. <laughs> and, you know, my wife came in one day and said, you realize everybody here is scared to death of you, right? And I'm like, me? Why, why? I'm a teddy bear. Why I'm would so anybody be scared of me? <laughs> and I got introduced to uh, doing a uh, disc profile. And I, I got an opportunity to do a disc profile. And they said, it's going to give you insights into your communication style, how you're perceived by people. Sure. So I took this disc profile and I got the results back and I ran it over. I said, Oh my God, no wonder everybody thinks I'm an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there was definitely uh, one thing I learned from, from uh, personality profiling is that th there's definitely a gap between, or, or sometimes there's a gap between how you think you're perceived and how you're actually perceived. Mm -hmm. And I realized I needed to change um, how I managed. And, and I, I, at that point, I, I started to have a little more self-awareness and, and over time it got better. And a few years later, I went back to Tom and I said, look, we're growing like crazy. Things are different. It's a very different culture. You know, I've learned a lot. I've changed a lot. Would you come back? I miss having you there. I, I realize now that you are the yin to my yang. I understand why you, why you, 
you know, you felt that there wasn't the communication there. And uh, he wasn't sure. He, he wanted to believe me, but he went out to, to lunch with my with uh, my senior engineer and uh, and my wife as well. And they said, no, really, it's it's, it's a different place. And he came back. And uh, one of the first things I do with all management people is to do the personality profile and do a debrief with the whole team. So we understand where each other's personality profiles fit. Um, and it was a really good session, but the, the, the kicker for me on that was that Tom looked at me on the way uh, out the door after the session. And he said, if we had had this three years ago, I never would have left. Oof. Hmm. And that made a believer out of me. So I am a big fan of using personality profiling for teams to understand one another, to understand how to communicate with each other better. Most importantly, to get self-awareness of how you communicate and how that may be perceived, both positively and negatively. Um, you know, uh, DISC is referred to often as the science of self which means the first thing you should take away from it, if anything, is self-awareness. Um, but we really integrated that into our hiring practice, into our, our team building practice, and it made a huge difference in us being able to build an incredibly strong and flexible team, making sure that we made the right hires and not just filling a seat. And uh, it allowed us to grow the company uh, very rapidly, and, and, and it allowed me to be more self-aware and to, to grow into the leader that I wanted to be, as opposed to the, the one that, that I was and had just had the skills that I inherited. Oh, Sean, I think you hit on something huge there, right? For those of us that are young in our leadership careers, it, it doesn't matter what age you are, but if you've never had the opportunity to lead... Sometimes it really is tough to look at that reflection in the window. And, and sometimes it's even about the insecurities we have in those roles too, as we're getting started and, and kind of taking charge. And I think that disc profile concept to really help with that self-awareness is huge. Because, you know, I look back at, you know, when we started my MSP 20 years ago too, I had no, we started because I, I, the company we worked for went out of business and we had a handful of customers that still wanted to be serviced, right? Myself and my partner, neither one of us had a leadership bone in our body at that stage. And man, when I look back at some of the things that we did and the way we treated some of the people early on, it's amazing that these people still talk to us. <laughs> well, you know, I, I teach a leadership course now. And, you know, one of the big um, negative impacts we have is um, think of who you think of as a leader. If I say, give me the name of a, of a dynamic leader. You know, who do we think of? We think of, um, you know, generals from World War II. We think of these, these people who come in and take charge and they, they, they tell everybody what to do, but that's really not an effective leader. That's not scalable. But unfortunately, ho Hollywood has perpetuated this myth yeah. that a leader comes in, tells everybody everything, and, and, and everybody else does what they're told. And, and that is not the way to build a highly effective organization. Leaders need to ask questions. They need to be humble. The hardest thing for me to understand and to learn was that they don't work for me. I work for them. And, and you really have to change that attitude. Um, and, and, you know, I'm a firm believer, you know, uh, leaders are not born. It is a taught skill. It is a learned skill. Um, you know, sometimes served, what, sometimes you learn those with a big dose of humble pie. Um, I'll be the first one to admit when, when that time came, it wasn't because I said, I want to improve myself and be a better leader. It was because I almost lost my company. And I realized, holy moly, I either need to learn how to be different and find another way to do this, or I'm not going to make my mortgage payment coming up. Um, so it was very humbling and, and it was, it was painful. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, it was not an easy process. And, and that's part of what I try to do now with people is make that process a lot easier. And as I tell clients, I am not standing here sitting at this table or standing in the front of this room because I'm the smartest guy in the room. I'm standing here because I've made every stupid mistake that I challenge you to try to beat me at. And, and, and please learn from my pain and my experience because it would be awful. It would be an awful waste if somebody didn't get some benefit out of it because I certainly paid the price for it. But 
Um, but leadership is, is a learned skill and it is a taught skill. And all you have to do is want to get better. And, and, and if you come to the table open-minded and willing to listen and willing to try new things, you know, you can become a leader. Um, even looking at, you know, let's take it even back to the DISC profile. There's a lot of people who know enough about DISC and other personality profiles to be dangerous. And they often, there's a lot of misconceptions. And every, what I hear often is, all right, well, to be a leader, you got to be a high D because, because all leaders are high D because that's that driving, charging personality. And, and just, and, and all sales, you know, you can't be a successful salesperson unless you're, you're a DI. And then that, that type of, of mentality is, is completely off the mark. Everybody can be effective with every personality profile. You just get to it a different way, but you need to learn how to take your style and leverage the pieces of it that, that will make you a good leader. Um, you know, I, I can think of the leaders in all aspects of the personality spectrum. Um, you know, uh, when I teach DISC and, and, and the different personality sciences, I often ask people as we go through each uh, different um, personality type, you know, think of a leader in this area, think of a sports figure, think of a, a personality. And um, yes, a lot of leaders do fall into that high D category, but there are still very effective mm -hmm. leaders in the other categories. And, you know, you want to talk about a person who who uh, leads not by emotion, but by pure data um, and, and lack of emotion, you know, look at Bill Belichick. I mean, talk about a successful leader who I, I would not put him in a pure high D box. Um, another great example of a, a leader who is uh, in disc parlance, uh, a high S leader is Reed team of rivals about Abraham Lincoln. I mean, talk about a person who was, completely selfless and not, he really didn't care about how he looked, but he wanted the best people on his team, regardless of whether they agreed with him or not. So, um, yeah, there's some good, great materials out there in leadership, but um, not to tie it all back to disc, but um, a great leadership book that I recommend um, regularly to clients is Turn the Ship Around uh, by David Marquette. He was the commander of a nuclear submarine. And it was one of the worst performing ships in the Navy. My former COO, Tom Mitchell, who's a, who was a submariner, was right across the dock from them. And when I brought him the book, he said, oh, yeah, I know that boat. They were definitely one of the worst. <laughs> and uh, he turned that ship around uh, to the best performing ship in the Navy in, in, in about 18 months. And it goes a lot into participative leadership and what they refer to as intent-based leadership. But the idea is you're developing leaders throughout the organization at every level. And I, I am a firm believer in that. And I think it is absolutely key for any business to be able to grow successfully um, and, and rapidly. So Sean, you, you've kind of touched on it here, but you know, after you sold your MSP, like wh wh what are you doing now? Like wh what do you have going on that you're, you know, out there with now? Sure. So after I sold the MSP, I, I, I took uh, a year off and um, decompressed a bit. Um, you can see my scuba tanks here behind me. I, I, I was a police scuba diver for many years in my, during my police career and um, decided to get back into it as an instructor. So I, I took a year, got my instructor card, did a lot of scuba diving in Aruba. And um, I worked there during the winters as a, as a part-time uh, dive instructor. And, uh, but I started up Encore Strategic Consulting because throughout my life, as also attested by the, by the fact that I work as a scuba instructor, I've always enjoyed teaching. I've taught college. I taught at the police academy. Um, it, no matter what I did, there was always a teaching component to it. And I really felt like, again, with all the lessons that I had learned in growing this company, that I wanted to be able to share those with people so that they avoid some of the pitfalls that I ran into. So Encore is, yes, we are a consulting company, but primarily we're a teaching company. And the idea here is um, that we bring business leaders together and we, we do peer groups. So we do CEO and peer groups for people at other levels of the organization. 
Um, the peer groups provide a support system and they provide uh, an accountability system. We do direct consulting. Uh, where we go in and we analyze the business and we provide, we provide help with best practices, leadership development, team development. Um, we uh, teach people um, how to optimize for uh, profitability. So one of the things we want our clients to be attaining is best in class profitability. So uh, our mantra for Encore is profit, grow, exit. And, and that really comes down to the philosophy that I have that you first need to fix the profitability in, in your business before anything else, because you have to be able to deliver things in a profitable manner. Um, you know, I, I see way too many business owners that, that bring to life the old joke of, uh, we'll sell it at a loss and make it up in, make it up in volume, you know? Right. And it doesn't work, unless maybe you're Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's about the only one, though. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Um, but you have to fix the profitability first. Once you fix the profitability, then we start focusing on the growth. And now that you have a good system to deliver a profitable product, how do we start scaling that? So how do we start growing the team? How do we start growing the market share? What are the different ways to grow the market share? And we start implementing strategies um, for, for that growth process. Um, you know, one of the key things I try to teach business owners is stop trying to look like everybody else um, because all you're doing is setting yourself up to compete on price. And the idea is that I want people to figure out what is your blue ocean? Um, you, you, there's a great book out there, Blue Ocean Strategy. And the idea is when you truly come up with a unique differentiator and you find a way to deliver your services that differentiates you from your other competitors, you take price off the table. It's now an apples to oranges comparison. So, People can't price shop. And if they see the value in the unique way in which you're delivering these services, um, then you've created a blue ocean because there's no competition. And the idea is then to maintain that and, and to pursue your market differently. I, I think one of the big problems I see in the MSP community is we are, um, we have just fallen into this trap of everybody copies everybody else. Yeah. And, and, and I fell into it myself. And the, you know, the day that that was an eye opener for me is I, I belong to several peer groups and a lot of us, you know, communicate uh, via email and chat groups, you know, uh, in between meetings to help each other out. And I said, Hey, does, does somebody have a sample contract that I, or a, co a contract that I could use for this aspect of the business? few people said, sure. I start getting emails with the contracts, with their contracts, of, uh, copies of their contracts. And I open one up and I go, huh, that's mine. I got back the same contract that I had sent out to somebody else about three <laughs> years before. So, it, you know, it, it just kind of made the loop and came back to me. And it was kind of an eye opener. And, you know, I see this in the way that a lot of MSPs market, you see a lot of people's websites mm -hmm. look the yeah, same, yes. uh, you know, you can, you can, I can go out and look at the websites and I can tell you who did them, <laughs> because, you know, um, it's just a very small community and, and we find that it's very easy just to copy what the other guys are doing than to go out and figure out how to be different. So one of the things that I really focus on is how do you go out into the market and be different? Not necessarily, you know, you're not necessarily delivering something different, but how do you package it differently, it's promote it differently? You know, it, it, it's the whole thing. And, and so it might be delivery if you've come up with something else. But, um, you know, a lot of people think you have to come up with something profound and earth shattering for it to be different enough to make a difference. And it doesn't. It, it's very, very subtle. Um but, but that's one of the areas that we, we tend to dive deep in is, is how do we truly come up with a unique differentiator that, that takes price off the table? So, um, so we're doing that and, uh, you know, and, and doing workshops and, uh, you know, Rob and Tim have worked with you on a few things and um, it, it's a lot of fun. So I, I you know, I, I'll tell you, you know, it's, 
it, it's amazing out there, you know, on all the things that are similar, but if you can find that 1% differentiator, it, like it just takes you to a whole yeah, different level. Changes everything. Changes Whether everything. Focus, you know, one industry, you know, just the way you package it. it the pack, yeah. 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 I, you know, I, and sometimes the funny thing is, is when you find it, you realize it was sitting there right in front of you the whole time. Yep. And, and, and sometimes it's just the way you go in and explain things to people. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the big mistakes I see, and I'm sure you guys see it in the sales side of things, is when we go in and talk to a pro prospect, we talk about me, 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 all this stuff that I'm going to do for you and I'm so good and my company is awesome and here's why we're awesome. As opposed to saying, you know, Mr. Prospect, you know, let me tell you how this is going to affect you. And, and you really need to take it to their level and, and how it how it affects their world. Because in the end, you know, everybody everybody is motivated by the same thing. What's in it for me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right. Um, as, as they should be. So All right. I'll, I'll tell you this, you know, Timmy's got some questions for you right now that uh, we ask every single people, uh, all the people that we ever bring on this show and nobody is exactly the same. So I want to see, you know, the great Sean, I want to see how you answer these, these very Five difficult questions. questions. Yeah, We're going to put you yeah, on the spot yeah, here. And, uh, ever. I should have known. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, these are so big I, brain questions, Sean, big brain. Don't, don't, yeah. get, so, don't get too hurt doing these. Yeah. Okay. All right. First one it doesn't include right, doing on. that. As long as it doesn't include doing math off the top of my head. I'm right. Like, and and yeah. don't shoot us because, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're in New Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Look for your die, baby. <laughs> All right. So the first one is uh, talk, text, or Teams? Uh, well, with, without, without hesitation, it's always going to be talk. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, it's definitely not going to be text. Now, Teams... We're in COVID there. times and yeah, can you, there. you know, can teams be effective way to talk? I think it can. It's definitely not a perfect replacement, but you know, it's a reasonable facsimile thereof. Yeah. No. It's, um, a, you know, it's, what, a, it's a suitable supplement. You know, on, on that note though, I mean, when you're talking about communication methodologies, one of the, and this goes back to my police days when they only email me, we had this uh, electronic email system before public email that was internal and it was on a, on a deck microvax. Um, and even then I saw where people would sit behind that we'd have the keyboard warriors that had, you know, that were sending off the flaming emails, ripping people to shreds, sending it out to everybody. And, and right then and there, I set a rule. And, and when I was heading the detective division, I told my guys, I said, if it's good news, you can send it via email. If it's informational, if it's just you're sending facts, you can send it via email. If it's bad news or something that I don't wanna hear, then you better come to me in person or come to each other in person. So, and I've held that rule to this day that if it's, if it's good news, you can send it via email. If you, if, if, if you, if you need to have a hard yeah. conversation, you better have it in person. We're as close to in person to me as you possibly can. Um, you know, I mean, I watch it on social media now all the time, the latest evolution of it, where people just rip each other to shred, you know, and people start arguing, you know, I love the Facebook arguments. Yeah, I'm really, you know, I guarantee if I just put one more post on there, I'm going to change their political right, affiliation. Yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. it's going to happen. <laughs> it's just like, you know what? Just anything I put up there, I, I, I try to keep it positive. And, and, but that's the same thing. Electronic communications, positive communications, or neutral communications only, no yeah. negativity. Yeah. So second one is uh, music, movies, or TV. Music. Yep. Okay. Oh, hands down. I got. You're, you can see over my shoulder here. I still have all my old vinyl records, you know, from the seventies, and um, I've got Sonos all over the house. And uh, on my motorcycle, I don't go anywhere without without music. So that's usually the first thing I add to a new bike when I get one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, um, I guess last one, I guess I, last one I'll ask is if 
there was anything you would do outside of the tech industry, uh, what would it be? Anything. Hot dog. So I, we always had a joke that when I told them when I, yeah. when I was all done with tech, the only thing I wanted was a hot dog cart because I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to make a decision that was more complicated than do you want mustard on that? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. hot dog cart. That's, okay. <laughs> that's my Fair. retirement plan. Yeah. All right. Very good. In Aruba. Yeah. In Aruba. Gonna, <laughs> All right. I'm going to have the Aruba hot dog cart. All right. Fair yeah. enough. All right. Well, Sean, uh, I really thank you for joining us today. It's uh, been great. Absolutely. Uh, for anyone that is looking to get in touch with Sean, we will be including his LinkedIn profile with the podcast. Also with this episode, we will be including uh, putting it on MSBBusinessSchool.com and anywhere you you get your podcast. Uh, Sean, any closing thoughts before we break away today? You know, no matter how bad business is going, you can always turn it around. It's always within your control. You can always make it better. Even if everything's going great, you can still make it better. Just got to approach it open-minded, always have a willingness to learn. Um, the number one skill that every business owner needs and every leader needs is curiosity. So get out there, be curious, curious, ask good questions. It'll take you far. Okay. Awesome. All, okay. Right. Thank you. Cool. All right. As always, thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate everybody being on here and we'll talk to you in the next episode. Yeah. Thanks, for, Thanks for coming on, Sean.